As our Father in heaven, now we come into your presence, seeking to do uh, your biddings, your work, your will, to motivate us, to help us, all those things in life that we need just to get through the next week. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon us now, that we may hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to begin something, a new series for the next 13 weeks, one of the longest ones I've done since I've been here. And I'm taking it from what I did back in November. Therefore, while I disappeared, I was like gone, AWOL from the church. But I was, part of my trip was I was up in uh, uh, Michigan, and then we went over to 3ABN, and I recorded a 13-part radio program called Inside Steps to Christ. And so what they wanted me to do was kind of take those chapters like I had been doing with the Wheel of Faith Ministries, but really get into each chapter. Because Wheel of Faith Ministries is all taken from the book Steps to Christ, but it's all over the place in a sense. They wanted me to methodically go through each chapter and grab a hold of that part of the chapter that deals with what God wants me to do. That part of the chapter that engages us, that, that collectively put together all 13 chapters has a message of engagement that creates transformation and change in any congregation. And so that is what we want to do today because it's imperative for your salvation. It's a way to start all over and say, okay, let me check where I'm at. I believe that the world is coming to its, its end. So let me see if my life is in conjunction with the most basic standard ideas of Christianity. I'm not talking about kitty stuff. Or, you know, I'm talking about deep concepts of Christianity that you should be having these experiences. And we'll go through each one of these chapters, really not through the book, The Steps to Christ. We're going to go through the Gospels. We're going to go through the Word of God using it as supporting material. And I think that if you do so with me and engage with me, like don't just listen. Some of you will just listen and go home and go, okay, it's good. But some of you will actually do. Almost every chapter has a charge in it. And those charges begin to build up in your life and something begins to happen. That's what I want to give to you. And to anyone watching online, to any churches, I was speaking to my uncle this past week about the woes of his little church where he is. He says, it's, Damon, it's got down to about 30 members and we're all old and tired. I mean, I've heard that before and I've seen it before. He was telling me about what their board had gotten together and what they thought, what can we do? We're going we're gonna to cease to exist. This brother's getting old. This brother's getting sick. This one's getting tired. This one's, and we're all wore out. We got to have new blood. And he was asking me what, what I thought. And I was listening to his ideas. They wanted to bring amazing facts out. They said, but they're too expensive. Said, yeah. And, but worth it. And then we, should we get a Bible worker? Should we hire? He was all these things I'm like, no, no, no. And he was telling me all the things that they thought about doing, but all the reasons why they couldn't work because they were too small now. They're too old. They're too poor. They're too weak. And I listened, and I listened, and I listened, and I said, you know, this is what you need. He says, what do you think we should do, Damon? I said, you need a revival with the gospel. You, you need to take those 30 people, because it don't take 30 people. It could take two people, 10 people, half of that amount in your church. And if they have a revival of primitive godliness, then that church will start to come alive. God will start sending people to it because you're preaching and doing what's right. And it will begin to, to grow. And every time I tell people this, you need a revival in the true gospel, the real gospel, the full gospel. It's always silence that follows. It's always tongue in cheek like, oh, yeah, okay, the gospel, yeah, Jesus, yeah, steps to Christ. I always get that. And I almost always want to go, oh, you don't know what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying because I've been around enough and I've been to enough places and I know what it does. But silence, and then, and then he just simply said this, well, 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 our church is dead. I hate to hear that, too, because when you say my church is dead, really, it's better stated this way, but yet, honestly, does anyone ever say it? What you're saying is we are dead, but no one ever says we're dead. My church is dead. No, your church is not dead. Your church has some powerful stuff that's asleep. And you're really not dead, spiritually speaking, anyway. You're just asleep, and you need to be awakened. And there is a message that will awaken us, but we think we know the message. And so instead of saying, yeah, 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 okay, well, then 
I'm not picking on my uncle. I hear this all the time. Instead of others or people saying, yeah, okay, what is that? Show me. How can we get there? What are the steps? We default back to, well, we're just a Sabbath-keeping group. We're going to leave our church open. We're going to keep the Sabbath. It's just going to be a place of worship, and we can be proud of our doctrines and proud of our prophecy. And we default to just what we believe in, and we just like, well, it's just the times that we're living in. We can't grow. Nothing we can do about it. There's so few of us. Ain't got nothing to do with numbers. I've learned this. Do you know what the world thinks of your Sabbath keeping? That's all you got. If you don't got what I'm talking about in the next 13 weeks, you know what they think of your Sabbath keeping and your prophecy and your strange views of the Pope? My grandson, I'm going to tell you this about my grandson, Leo. This is what the world thinks of it. My grandson, a couple weeks ago, I went over to him. He says, Popo, I want you to listen to this song. And he was like giggling. I was like, oh, no. He goes, I want you to listen to this song. I've come to hate this song because I can't get out of my head. But he wanted me to listen to this song. And, and the song says this. It starts off with a bunch of kids singing. All we ever hear from you is blah, blah, blah. So all we ever do is go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't even care about what you say. Uh, blah, 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 and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I told Mary, I said, that is a rebellious song. That is a terrible song for kids to hear. But then I, I kept listening to that song in my head thinking, what a prophetic song. What does the world think of a church that's been given the greatest opportunity in the world and has done nothing but come to church but worship? What does the world think about your Sabbath and all your prophecy and all your understanding without the illumination of Christ and the Holy Spirit burning in your soul and heart, having something to say without that? It's just a bunch of all you ever say is blah, blah, blah. So all we ever do is yah, yah, yah. There's a reason why they don't come. It's not because something's wrong with the truth. The truth is powerful. Amen. It's convincing. It is perfect and infallible. Amen. The problem is we need to be revitalized. Amen. We need to have what Steps to Christ is trying to give us, Amen. trying to bring in an experience with the gospel. Something that slides in, and if you'll follow through, I'm telling you, something will happen. Hey, what needs to be happened is not a world that's going to be saying blah, blah, blah. But we're told, you remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 12, when we're told when the, latter rain, when the former rain fell on their Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit fell on them, and the people, you know what the people said? It says the people were perplexed and astonished and said, what is this? Not blah, blah, blah. When the Spirit falls on you and gets a hold of you, when you speak about the Sabbath, when you speak about prophecy, when you speak about doctrines, the world will say, what is this? And they'll want to come and they'll want to hear. I don't care if you only got 10 people in your church. Somebody's going to show up because you, under the inspiration of the Spirit, are giving life to the message. You were given that message, what the Bible says, is a certain sound. And the truth seeker will hear it. I don't care what the world calls you, occult or crazy or weird or strange. It doesn't matter if they're looking for truth. There's only one place that's got the right chords, Amen. and that is this place. Unless you are not being played by the Holy Spirit. Then you're just a house of worship. You're just a bunch of blah, blah, blah. So what I want you to do is... Follow with me, because the book Steps to Christ, we have a Spanish and a English. We got a bunch more back here. So what I would like for you to do is today, make sure you have this, because each chapter, when we go through it, there's going to be charges, there's going to be commands, and I want you to take this little book. So this week, we're going to be on chapter one. When you've done, we've done chapter one together, and they give you some food for thought, then go home and make chapter one your study, your devotion. Do it Friday night together. Tear it apart. Talk about its themes right in the book. Put your thoughts and let chapter one do its work. Do what it tells you to do. And go through the motions of it all and allow this thing to happen in us because 13 chapters later, I promise you, you're going to be a different person. And if you're already on that road, you're going to be a deeper person. 
And so let's just, you know, think about that for a moment. My first pastorship, the first place I got to be a, a pastor was down here in Huntsville. And, and I never forget, I, the, about the second or third Sabbath into everything, I was preaching my heart and soul out, and Miss Joyce came up to me. And she walked up to the, to, to the pulpit. There was about 10 people in church. And she walked up and looked at me, and she gave me that bless your heart look. She never said a word. She just smiled. And, yeah, for y'all remember Miss Joyce. But she just smiled like that, and she handed me a book. And it said, How to Survive a Dead Church. This is what I want to be done with. I don't want to survive a dead church. I want to be in a revived church. Amen. And we are going to give you a formula. It's already, this thing is, is since 1892, this formula has been around. And it works wherever it's embraced by the heart. So let's jump in to chapter 1. And just empty your mind, but not your reason or your logic. And just let it sink in what we're saying. When we get to the end, let the plug hit you. Let the catch. Because there is, a, there is something at the end of this chapter that comes in. And if that one little thing is taken hold of, everything changes. So let's get to that one little thing. Chapter 1 begins this way. Nature and revelation alike testify of God's love. Our Father in heaven is the source of life, of wisdom, and of joy. Look at the wonderful and beautiful things of nature. Think of the marvelous adaption to the needs and happiness not only of man but of all living creatures. The sunshine and the rain that gladden and refresh the earth, the hills, the seas, and plains all speak to us of the Creator's love. God has bound our hearts to Him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and earth. Through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, he has sought to reveal himself to us. So the first thing that we're going to think about is how does nature reveal God's love to us because we're going to get a challenge about this later. I know you think, oh, okay, here we go, nature reveals. You know, when, I, when we went to uh, our Hot Springs, Arkansas, it is one of the most beautiful places in planet Earth. It is beautiful. And it speaks about the Creator like nothing else because you are drawn to Him there. You are absolutely drawn to the Creator when you go there. Your mind cannot help but to go upwards when you look at the canyons and the rocks and the cliffs and the pools and the water and just the entire geography of the place. Your mind naturally soars to the heavens. And I know this is true because there is someone else that comes there. That's also drawn, but they have been derailed. I, I was speaking to a preacher that was there, and I said, what is going on with the witchcraft around here? He says, oh, man, let me tell you, this is one of the hottest places for neo-paganism, witchcraft, and occult worship here in Hot Springs. And he made the connection. It's the natural beauty of the place. God is drawing mankind to himself in these beautiful places of nature and when people come there, if you're not being drawn to God, if you're not recognizing it's the hand of God speaking to you, you can begin to worship the creation. Now, is this a biblical thought in chapter 1, Steps to Christ? It surely is, because look at what Paul says in the book of Romans. He says this very thing about nature. You want to get somebody disconnected from God? You want to get a child disconnected from God? Before you ever get them to church, get them out in nature. There's plenty of studies of how pathfinders have worked in this very way. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says this in verse 20. He says this, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He is saying there is nobody in the judgment that's going to be able to say they did not know me because I am revealed in nature. I I've chose to reveal myself. When you look up in the heavens, I have chose to speak to you that way. When you see the green trees or the tall whispering pines of East Texas, I have chose to reveal myself in those places. But if you refuse to hear me, then Paul says this. This is the natural outcome. If you refuse to hear God in nature, he says this. 
Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in their lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. God wants to speak to you, but on a fundamental level, if people turn from him, he'll give them up to themselves and they start at worshiping the creation. And you see that all through Arkansas, everywhere. You see beautiful places. You see pagan worship because God was speaking. And at some point in their mind, they said, nah, I'm not going to serve you. I'm going to, and they're drawn and they start worshiping the things. And do we not do that still today? We're not bowing down going, um, lum, 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 but when we spend time and money and life on the world, it's a form of worship in it. God says, are you, are you hearing me in nature? Number one, Steps to Christ is going to tell you, and it's going to be part of our charge, get out in nature and deliberately listen to his voice. Most of the world right now is being drawn into big urban environments where there is very little nature. And there is a reason for that. God is saying, hook up with your pathfinders. (laughs) Get out in the night sky. Go take a walk somewhere. This week is one of the things you're going to do. You're going to go out into nature, and you are going to let your mind gravitate towards the Most High and let him whisper whatever he wishes to whisper in your mind. God is revealing his love for you. Another thing, she says, but more than this, the deepest and tenderest earthly ties. Think about this. Meaning, meaning I have revealed my love to you in nature, but you, you didn't hear that. So I, I want to reveal myself in, in the most tenderest human ties. So think about that. In other words, when Adam was created, he was an autonomous being. He could have been, he lived forever. He probably would have never transgressed. God could have created a bunch of autonomous little atoms, you know, beings that didn't procreate. And Adam was a perfect being. He wasn't sorrowful. He wasn't sad. He saw that he didn't have a mate, but he wasn't miserable, upset, or in any way having any kind of bad, gloomy feelings. He could have existed that way still to this day in perfect happiness with communion with just God. But God did something. He put Adam to sleep and took out of him a rib or what some call the half of Adam And he created Eve, and that feeling, that attraction, that desire, that 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 bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, I shall call you woman, for you were taken out of me. That is God says, that what we call love. God says, first John 4a, I am love. In other words, every time you look at your wife, every time you look at your husband, every time you look at that child, all right, Eric and Mackenzie, that love that's growing, God says that's That is from me. That's who I am. And by looking at love in our world around us, in our relationships, we can know that God loves us. Infinitely more than I love Mary or that I love my daughters or my son. He's saying, look at those things and you can see that I love you. Unfortunately, this was not enough to captivate the human heart. It wasn't enough. Nature was supposed to be enough. Adam and Eve's love for one another was supposed to be enough, but for some reason it wasn't enough to convey God's love. Sin came, nature became obscured and tainted, and the relationship between man and woman became strained, selfish, even abusive and brutal. Nature nor relationships were enough to teach us that that God loves us. It became lost on the human race till God had destroyed the world with the flood. Ellen White says, here's the second thing that God did to reveal his love. The word of God reveals his character. He himself has declared his infinite love and pity. When Moses prayed, show me thy glory, the Lord answered, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. This is his glory. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He is slow to anger, great in kindness, because he delighteth in mercy. We usually use this to talk about, oh, this is the character of God, and this is supposed to be our character. But, yeah, yeah, in a secondary sense, in a primary sense, this is his glory, his love. 
for the human race. His mercy, his grace, his desire to help and heal and change and transform you and give you everything that you need. That's his desire. His love has been written to us. Think about in Hosea chapter 11, verse 8, where, where God says, Oh, how can I give you up, Israel? My heart churns within me. My soul, my heart is broken over you. That's what she means. God has spoken directly to us under men of inspiration and said, Go tell them now face to face that I love them and my heart is broken. Who can forget Song of Solomon, a picture of God's love for the human race? When she doesn't get up to answer the, the knock of her beloved. And she goes, but she hesitates. It's a picture of us. And he's at the door, and finally he waits, and he waits, and he, and he leaves. And he says, oh, oh, my beloved, why didn't you answer the door? I had all this love to, to give, to bequeath to you. Why won't you receive my love? It is a picture of God's love for the human race. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, who was a picture of God, who went around with his hand in his face, weeping because he so loved his people. Or the picture of God in the story of the, of the prodigal son, seeing him from afar off, the father runs and hugs him and throws his, his arms around him. It's a picture of God's love all through the scriptures. Otherwise, it says, God is screaming, I love you, I love you, I, I love you. The second thing we're told to do, first thing, go out into nature. Look at, look at your relationship with your wife tonight or your husband or your child and say, man, God loves me. The second thing is to pick up God's word and go through there and do some word searches this week. God's love, the love of God, mercy. Just look up some things and just randomly read some things about God's love. However, and unfortunately, and yet again, the quote ends with these words, yet these but imperfectly represent his love. They imperfectly represent. Thus, God would have to do something much more drastic to get our attention. He would have to do something that the universe would have went, oh, what? Lucifer himself might have said when he heard what God was going to do, huh? No way. Uh-uh. No way the universe in horror realized that God was a drastic God of love his love was drastic if like the song goes not reckless just who would do that Satan had so deceived the world about God's love that the word was unclear Nature was obscured. Relationships surely didn't show God's love anymore. It was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. Don't miss that. He came to live among men. Now, there's a difference in what I'm about to say. The Greeks had no problem with this. The Greeks believed that God came down to the earth all the time, popped up in human form or form of whatever, Gods would come down to help the human race. Sometimes the gods would have relationships with an earthly woman and have a material body, cre body created and then download into that a spiritual form. And so, you know, Greeks believed in that dualistic way that the body was made out of the earth from women and men coming together, but then the spirit would come from out somewhere and download into the body. And then when the body was old and done with, then the body would go down and the spirit would go back to bliss where it came from. That's where the Roman church got it. The idea, you know, all the Christians believes that Scientology is really big on that idea. Bodies were created for spirits to come in. But they got to go back home like Hercules. Hercules was created with this kind of demigod union. And then in order for him to escape his fleshly body, he threw himself on a pyre and burned himself up. And then he went back to Mount Olympus where he came from. But this is not what the Bible says Jesus did. The Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Giving you that orientation, the Mount Olympus, if you will. He was with God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and the Son. He was there. And then verse 14, it says, the Word became flesh. It uses the word sarke, not soma. The word for body is soma. 
The word for flesh is sarke. He, the word became sarke. The word became flesh. In other words, divinity, the uncreated divine being called the Son of God, came and enmeshed himself, entwined himself with human DNA, <laughs> wrapped himself in flesh, and that is a permanent solution. It created a bond between the human race and God that cannot be broken. It cannot, the scripture says, it cannot be broken. He didn't just leave the body and go back to the heavens like, ha, the, here I am, the, the bejeweled prince of heaven again, like I was. Nope, he entered into our flesh, into our DNA, into our genetics because he had to help us. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 through 9 Paul gives this wonderful illustration. He's quoting the Psalms. Hebrews 2, verse 3 through 9. Well, let's just pick it up here with verse 5. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. And the Jews thought, oh, that's us. And then Paul says, no, it's not. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. That is the great love of God, that he didn't just die, but he became one of us and stayed one of us and died, of course, yes, as one of us. He came from the bosom of the Father, the Scripture says. You know the word bosom? It means the place of the Father, like not like the same idea as the Father. We don't believe in some of those weird beings that he was just a phantom that came out of God. But he came from the place of the Father, the same station of the Father. He came from that place, from the bosom, and he came and became something a little lower than the angels. The commander of the angels, the creator of the angels, became a little lower than the angels. And this is what John 3.16 actually means. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we think gave, just all Calvary. No, God gave his son. Not just to be the propitiation, not just to be the example for living, but he gave. He gave him to the human race. He was here in this place, and he took him, and he gave him to us. And he is our brother. He is one with us. He was given to us, not temporarily, but for all of eternity. Amen. This is the great love of God manifested to us in Christ. And this, from another place, this isn't from Steps to Christ, but I had to put it in here because it's unbelievable. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature, even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. But Jesus, Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. It's unbelievable. I, he looked down at the, at the human race and he says, oh man, 4,000 years from Adam, it is going to be a mess. No one's going to know how to do anything. Even my people who are supposed to tell the world the truth, they are not going to know a thing about me. No one's going to know how to handle sin, how to deal with depression and anxiety and troubles and sorrows. Well, the world is going to be coming to its end. They're going to be tapping out, giving out, turning to paganism, turning to weird ideas. No one is going to know how to survive a sinful world unless you, son, go to it and show them how to way through it. He came to help us deal with death and loss, disease, suffering, poverty, disappointment, discouragement, despair, depression, all those things that, that heap up on all of us at any one given time and threaten the very spiritual life of us to just give up and get out. Go have fun. Go do what the world does. But God says, nope, nope, nope. Look to my son who came and he gave you an example. 
So no matter what we go through or how bad it gets, and it can get rough at times, right? It can get so bad at times that you wonder if you have been forsaken by God. I have heard it from many of you, and you have heard it from myself. At what point do you finally say, God, isn't it a time for a break? Isn't it a time for a season of goodness and fatness and blessing? I prayed that not long ago, and what happened? Oh, the past three weeks of total chaos. God, what is going on? Why, why, Damon, <laughs> do you not understand this? And I've come to learn this now, personal testimony time. The worse things get, the harder things get, the more I feel his presence with me. And I can't explain it. It's a mystery. It's not some cheeky little statement. It is a truth. My problems are not solved. The issues are still hard. We still don't know this and that. And I hear some of your lives, and you're like, Pastor, when am I going to be done with these problems? It's just they just keep coming and coming and coming. That's okay. God says, I got a plan in that. You're going to look at my son, how to get through that. But in that, you are going to get closer to me than you've ever been before. And that's what Paul says. Paul, the great writer in Romans, he was very clear in what was going on in his life. He wasn't ashamed of it. He didn't glorify it. But then he gets to this place after talking about how terrible his life has had been as being a follower of Christ. And then he says this in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Chapter 8, verse 35 of Romans Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's a test. Testimony. It's not theology. It's a testimony, one that I have lived and one that many of you have lived. And so you need to tell those around you that are going through these troubles, the love of God is ever present the deeper the trouble goes. It is a testimony to add to the theology saying, man, I know he loves me. Not because he's answered my prayers. For the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, Job said. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Blessed be the one that loves me. Amen. Blessed be the one that's coming back for me. Blessed be the one that's got my back. <laughs> the great love of God. So forgive me, Damon. Forgive me, my daughter, when I don't panic as you do. Forgive me that I don't care about the things that you care about. Because I see a bigger plan. I see eternity. Everything that you are worried about, Damon, is temporary and slated for the flames. Everything in this house you're worried about, this is crooked, this ain't working around, this has got a little chip. All of these things are nothing. All of the fears that you have, all of these things that cause us to do these stupid things. God's like, I ain't worried about that because I love you. I see eternity. I've got a future for you, and i got to get you there. And so before I can get you there, I'm going to have to drag you through the mud because you ain't listening. You got all your assurance and your money. You got all your assurance that your cre credit score is good, that your debt's paid off. Your assurance is in the fact that your, your 401 k has got this much in it, and you got this much money in the bank. Your assurance is in all these things. That may not be bad. I, I told you to go out and be productive and be fruitful and multiply and take care of your business, but your assurance is in the wrong place, so guess what's going to happen to your assurance? <laughs> God! Somehow through all of that, his voice comes piercing into my ears. I love you, Damon. Hang in there. And it assures me. And I get up, and I come to church this morning, and I have a song in my heart again. I didn't come to church Wednesday night. I called it off. I said, George, you got to help me, please. I am in a bad place. My emotions, my heart was broken. My angry, I was mad, I was upset. I was losing control. The only thing that's changed 
is God reminded me of his love as I started looking at chapter one, Steps to Christ, preparing for the sermon this week. I said, oh, God, <laughs> what a fool I am again. Forgive me. Continue <laughs> doing what you got to do, Amen. right? More than just an example to survive, there was a price that had to be paid for the human race. More than just saying, hey, I'm going to help you all get through this earth, uh, you all got another problem. A price has got to be paid. A courtroom case has got to be had. A judgment's got to be pronounced. And sentence has got to be carried out on the human race for their sin and transgression against me. And now we go to Pilate's court. It wasn't just a court in 2,000 years ago in Rome. That courtroom was for you. He was, he was going through what the human race will go through if they're lost. And the judgment that is taking place now. In the heavens, soon to conclude, he was going through a judgment on earth so that you don't have to. He stood before Pilate's cruel court, laughed at, mocked at, jeered at, beaten, stripped down. He stood before Herod being laughed at, beat down, mocked, jeered. The king of the universe hanging on a cross. He did that. He took, when Pilate said, I, I, I find no fault in him, but by the way, uh, he's guilty. We're going to have to send him out. That was your guilt sentence. Judgment was passed on him. It was passed on, on you. Except we get the benefit of it not having to be put on me personally. And in this way, we are told that the love of God was demonstrated the most fully at Calvary's cross. Take your mind to these places, Steps to Christ begins to wrap it up. Take your mind to these places, and it is for good reason. History speaks of no other being that loves us like that. Zeus, Jupiter, all these return to these Egyptian gods that our people are fascinated with, Mother Earth, the great cosmic consciousness, Wiccan religions, the mysterious powers, energies, none of that can love you. It's just gimmickry to suffice your stricken conscience that says it's time to come face to face with a God that loves you and wants to be in relationship with you and wants you to listen. Now this amazing statement. Listen to this. Jesus said, therefore, does my father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. That is, my father has so loved you that he even loves me more for giving my life to redeem you. That is a profound statement. How can God love anything more? You'll never find that anywhere. How can God, he's a love, perfect, infinite love. How can he love anything more? But he said, when it came to the human race, whom I loved, I love my son even more for having saved them. I didn't mean much to me until I ended up one day divorced and remarried to a woman who was divorced and remarried, and we had stepkids. And as over the years, I have watched Mary love my daughter, as I have watched her give of herself to her and develop this relationship with Ella, I have come to love her more because of her love for my daughter. And that tells you how much I love my daughter. That I could love this person more, but I do. And that's what the text is saying. The father loves me more. The emphasis is not on the love of the Father for the Son more. The emphasis is on how much He loves us. <laughs> that He considered it glory to watch His Son. Would you consider it glory to watch your child die for someone that didn't even care? But God said it was glory for me because I loved you. I love this human race. I love each and every one of you individually as if you were the only person on the planet. I know you. I look into your eyes every day. I see your life transpire every day before me. I know the ins and outs of everything going on in your life, every heartache, every woe, every child that you pray for. I know it all. I love you, and I got your back. Turn your life to me. That's why Morris Vinden made that statement years ago. He said how hard it is to be lost. It's hard to be lost because in order to be lost, you got to get past the great wall of God's love. You have to do some kind of something to turn out that kind of love. When Julia Roberts was asked, why in the world did you marry Lyle Lovitz? The ugliest guy in country music that ever has been. Married one of the most beautiful women of Hollywood. 
She said, because he kept telling me that he loved me. We are the ugly ducklings of the universe. God is telling you over and over that I love you. I love you. At some point, you must give way to that. Now, for that paragraph that the chapter ends with, this paragraph is everything. This is what the church where my uncle lives needs. This is what you need. This is what I need. If we're ever going to finish our work, if we're ever going to become the people of latter rain, if we're ever going to get out there and, and take this church to the next level because it was here, it's here, it needs to go up one more. Boy, what an impact. If we're ever going to become that, if you're ever going to become the kind of husband or wife you want to be, the father that you want to be, the son or daughter that you want to be, the friend that you want to be, man, listen to this. If you ever want it to be in that final generation that does unbelievable things, as our music group's getting ready to come up with their closing song, I want, I want you to pay attention to this one most profound statement. Such love is without a parallel. Children of the heavenly king, precious promise, theme for the most profound meditation, the matchless love of God for a world that did not love him. Now catch the punchline. The thought has a subduing power upon the soul and brings the mind into captivity to the will of God. The more we study the divine character in the light of the cross, the more we see mercy, tenderness, and forgiveness blended with equity and justice, and the more clearly we discern innumerable evidences of a love that is infinite and tender, pity surpassing a mother's yearning sympathy for her wayward child, the more we focus on Christ and His love, it will subdue the human heart and bring our mind into captivity to the will of God. Is that not powerful? Not focusing on your perfection, not per focusing on your sin or how good I'm doing or becoming like Jesus. None of that. That's all fruit of doing one thing, focusing on God's love as we have prescribed today. Through the cross, through his life, through nature, through the word, through your looking at your wife or your husband, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, focusing on him captivates the soul and brings the mind into captivity and we will be changed we will be righteous by faith that one act alone hinges everything in adventism because we have figured it out we can't do it <laughs> dr ray you are right we will wander on this god forsaken earth forever until we get our eyes on the one that loves us and start letting that penetrate this hardened heart and soul. And Father, when we do that, now I will be brought into captivity to his will. Now I will go out and proclaim and give to our budget, to anything that proclaims his name. I will do whatever you ask, Lord. I will let whatever hell comes upon me, let it come because you love me and we're going to get through it. Amen. That is what chapter one's about. So the takeaway tonight, get a steps to Christ if you don't got one. If we run out, I'll get you some more. You're gonna go home this week and for your devotional, your Sabbath walk this afternoon, in the rain, wherever, you're gonna get into nature and say, all right, Lord, I wanna hear you speak. I mean, take your whole family out there. Let's just talk to God. Then maybe tonight or tomorrow night, you get into the Word and do some word searches on God's love and just let the Psalms and the Proverbs talk to you about His love for you. Then at some time, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday night, if you don't come to prayer meeting, spend some time looking at the life of Christ, the closing scenes particularly, chapter 70 through the end of the book. And then ask God through under the illumination of the Holy Spirit, Father, open my mind to this love and let it do its work. That's our homework. Take the book to this week. Get into it. Do these things. Let it soften you up. And then we'll take the next step next week together, chapter 2, Amen. The Sinner's Need. Let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, what an amazing thing your love how tragic it is that it has not subdued our souls and brought our minds into captivity to the will of God. We recognize that maybe it has for some of us in some ways, maybe some in deeper ways, but maybe a lot of us not much. But today we are recognizing it is the key to everything. 
to unlock the door of our heart, our service, our life. Lord, to those that are willing, give them that Laodicean eye salve of the Holy Spirit that they may see your love more clearly this week than ever before and let it begin that work that you wish to do in their lives and in any church that takes this step with us here in Conroe. May you bless us to this end, we pray, Father, in your holy name. Amen.